Welcome back to another edition of The Right Guys Podcast. My name is Max McGuire. I want to talk about a case in California that's going on right now. Miller versus Bonta. Now, this is a case that was originally filed years ago, challenging California's so-called assault weapons ban. Basically, the law that California passed, um, stretching all the way back to the 1990s, restricting what kind of semi-automatic rifles, pistols, and shotguns civilians can own. Now, that law has gotten stricter over time. This lawsuit was originally filed before the Supreme Court issued its New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin decision. So when it was challenged originally, the statute in California was upheld as being constitutional in 2021. The New York Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin case obviously came down not just upholding the right of Americans to bear arms in public for self-defense to conceal carry, but also restricting how circuit courts and district courts can interpret the Second Amendment. So prior to Bruin, it was very common in these district and appellate courts for them to engage in a process known as interest balancing. What that essentially means is that if you claim that you have a Second Amendment right, but the government says that their gun control restriction should be allowed because it's in the interest of public safety, then the courts can balance those competing interests, balance interest, interest balancing. How fundamental a right is will determine how much weight can be given to the government's public safety arguments or whatever other interest argument they have. But that was basically how the courts were upholding gun control laws that very obviously violated the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms that shall not be infringed. Second Amendment says shall not be infringed. There's lots of laws that infringe upon it. The way that they justified those is by claiming that it was in the public interest, that the government had an interest in promoting public safety, and that that should trump your individual rights in certain situations. Supreme Court said, no, 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 can't do that. Can't interest balance, interest balance away the Second Amendment. Um, you have to use a historical test looking at what the Second Amendment meant. And basically, the Supreme Court came down with a very simple test. They said that if the plain language of the Second Amendment protects an individual's conduct, then that conduct is presumptively constitutional unless the government can prove that there is an analogous historical precedent of similar gun control regulation. Basically, your conduct is presumed to be constitutional unless the government can prove a historical precedent stretching back to two specific periods, the founding of the country and the ratification of the 14th Amendment, those two periods being most important because that's obviously when the Second Amendment was written and when it was incorporated to the states. If the government can point to a history of firearm regulation that is similar enough to their proposed regulation, then it can be upheld as constitutional if those analogous gun control laws date back to those two specific time periods. So. Since Bruin, there's been this massive rush for governments to try and argue that, oh, their constitutional infringements are actually constitutional um, because it's always been like this. There's a, there's a tremendous amount of gaslighting taking place right now where the government's trying to claim that, oh, assault weapons have always been banned or the government has always banned weapons like assault weapons when the historical record is clear prior to the 1990s. There has been no pervasive state law, no significant state law that has restricted what kind of firearms people can own other than machine guns, other than machine guns. So I wanted to go through today and look at this case um, because there was an oral argument session in the Ninth Circuit. Obviously, this went to Judge Benitez, covered this on the podcast. He had an excellent decision, um, basically striking down the uh, California's assault weapon ban as unconstitutional. That was obviously appealed. And now it was before a three-judge panel of the Ninth Circuit. And they had oral arguments in this case. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to fact check the government attorney in real time. 
I'm going to see if I can find out the attorney's name. If I can find out, I'll put it on the screen right here. Um, he, he He's spreading a lot of BS. And the the plaintiffs in this case did a an okay job at really refuting the main points. The issue is he can spew a lot more bullshit in his time than the plaintiffs would have to refute it and also present their arguments. So a lot of the refutations are going to have to be done in written arguments. But I wanted to go ahead and play this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to play it and I'm going to stop it. And I'm going to, I have some prepared notes just so I can follow them and kind of fact check this in real time and show some citations. So show some different um, bits of law and, and case law to explain why the government's argument is bogus and why it has to be resisted with everything we've got. So I'm going to play that in a second. Before I do, hit that subscribe button. Hit that share button. Really, really important. We want to grow this channel. And the only way we can do that is with your help. So if you like this kind of content, you want to see more of this kind of content, please do hit the share button. Please do subscribe. And please do comment. Okay, so without further ado, this is the oral arguments from last week. And just as a, just, just to set this up, um, since these oral arguments have taken place, the Ninth Circuit has placed a stay on this because... The full Ninth Circuit is reviewing whether or not it's constitutional for California to ban so-called high-capacity magazines. So they've basically put this case on hold until the magazine question is solved because they think that that's going to inform this case. So without further ado, here is the state of California's argument for why it should be constitutional for them to ban most semi-automatic rifles, pistols, and shotguns. Here we go. But meanwhile, we can get started with the argument. Our sole case set for today, and that is Miller versus Bonta. When you're ready, counsel. Come on, my guy. I should have fast. Good afternoon. Days. May it please the court. John Echevarria for the California Attorney General and the Director of the Bureau of Firearms. I'd like to reserve three minutes of my time for rebuttal. Yeah, yeah. All right. I'll try to help you out, but please keep your eye on the clock as well. I appreciate that, Your Honor. Thank you. The Supreme Court has repeatedly told us that certain types of weapons are not entitled to Second Amendment protection and may be banned, including the M16 rifle and the like. In this case, plaintiffs are challenging eight defined categories of assault weapons that are banned because of the dangers they pose to the public, particularly in mass shootings. Those weapons configurations are defined by certain tactical features and accessories that make those weapons offensive military weapons and not weapons of ordinary self-defense. Now, this is something that you're going to hear them talk about repeatedly over the course of this entire video. Um, talking about how on, the only weapons that should be permissible to own, I just realized that my collar is completely off. Um, the only weapons that civilians should be allowed to own are the ones that they subjectively believe to be, I just made it worse, uh, defensive. And that if they determine, I can't believe I just did this whole video with that. So they're claiming that if a gun, in their opinion, is more offensive than defensive, it can be preemptively banned. Not just, so like the one solution would be to punish the people who use it to commit crimes, right? What they want to do is restrict everyone from using it under the fear that some of them might use them to commit crimes. And th this, this focus on the military features of a gun is really interesting because before the Supreme Court issued its Heller decision in 2008, the prevailing understanding of the Second Amendment was guided by M United States versus Miller, which is a case from the 1930s that upheld the National Firearms Act. This is the law that was put in place to heavily regulate machine guns, short barreled rifles, short barreled shotguns, um, explosives, right? Destructive devices, any other weapons. Um, so what that case had held is that the Second Amendment only protects a collective right for militia service and if you're expected to show up for the militia with your personally owned firearm you don't have a right to own any weapon that wouldn't be useful for militia service that that's what the prevailing notion was so when miller came around which i i, I 
outline this all in my book, The Conservative's Guide to Winning Every Gun Control Argument. Miller was a terrible case because obviously it's a felon who was caught in possession of a short barreled rifle, but um, Miller died before the case could be decided. And his attorney never actually went to the Supreme Court for oral arguments. So basically it was an ex parte case before the Supreme Court where the government just had free reign to argue whatever it wanted. And there was no one there to argue in, in defense of uh, the Second Amendment. So what they found was that a short barreled shotgun and in turn short barreled rifle was not constitutionally protect, protected because it wouldn't be useful for militia service because at the time the United States military was not using short barreled shotguns or short barreled rifles. Now there's evidence to suggest that that even then was wrong. But what's really interesting is at the time, the restrictions for SBRs were the same as SBS's 18 inch barrel. If you had less than an 18 inch barrel on a shotgun or a rifle, you were in violation of the NFA if it wasn't re registered. So what makes that really comical is in World War II, the United States, one of the standard issue rifles, other than the M1 Garand, one of the standard issue rifles was the M1 Carbine that was particularly useful for smaller soldiers who maybe couldn't carry the heavier rifle and heavier ammunition, paratroopers, uh, soldiers who would be uh, working in tank crews or other confined spaces. The M1 Carbine was designed to be a rifle that was more maneuverable and more easily carried. And so the M1 Carbine had a barrel length less than 18 inches long. M1 Carbine's barrel length came in at 17.75 inches. Now that might not seem significant, but in the world of the NFA, if you're off by a quarter of an inch, you're a felon. So it's incredibly interesting that United States versus Miller was cited in 1939. Government argued that there was no civilian or military utility for a short barreled rifle or shotgun. But then just three years later, the United States military began fielding what then, according to the law, was a short barreled rifle. And then when World War II was over, the government looked at this stockpile of M1 Garands, understood that the technology was going a different direction. M1 Garand had horrible track record, really terrible anecdotal um, reports out of Korea that the M1 Garand was underpowered. Now, some of that might just be myths, but th there were people who swore by it the fact that when North Koreans came over the hill wearing multiple layers of jackets and an ice, that the M1 carbine wasn't taking them down. So there was a definite effort within the United States military to move beyond the M1 carbine. So they understood they had to sell them. So they wanted to sell them to civilians. So <laughs> they, they ended up selling them to civilians. Almost a quarter million of these M1 carbines were sold to U.S. civilians. It was only later that the government realized, ho, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. We just violated the National Firearms Act a quarter of a million times because they had actually sold short barreled rifles to civilians without them being registered. So when the Gun Control Act of 1968 came around, they amended the NFA to reduce the rifle length to 16 inches to retroactively make all of those transfers legal. And I say this because every firearm that has been in civilian hands has at some point stemmed from military technology, right? The driving force behind firearm advancements has not been hunting, target shooting, self-defense. It's been military applications. And as those military applications are developed, they roll out similar product lines for civilians. This is the case all the way through to the first firearms. It's just interesting that here, California is saying that if a firearm has military applications, it shouldn't be available to civilians when the old pre-Heller understanding was that that's the only guns that should be constitutionally protected and that the government has actually sold hundreds of thousands of rifles to civilians that by California's own definition would be banned in the state. So that's a really long explanation for the first minute. <laughs> well, let's keep listening. These restrictions are constitutional under Bruin. At the threshold stage, Plaintiffs have failed to show that each of the categories of assault weapon is presumptively protected by the Second Amendment. So they had this backwards. They had this completely backwards. As I said at the start, when, Bru when Bruin was decided, it held that the Second, Amendment plain, Second Amendment's plain text covers an individual conduct. And if it does, then that conduct is presumptively protected. When something is presumptively protected, that means it is protected unless proven otherwise. 
the burden falls upon the government to justify regulation that presumptively constitutional conduct, not, in this case, the plaintiffs. It's not the plaintiff's job to prove that they deserve the right. That's why it's called the Bill of Rights and not the Bill of Needs, right? But here you can see that California is trying to flip this burden upside down and claim that the plaintiffs, in this case, suing to overturn the law, haven't done enough to prove that the, their conduct is constitutionally protected. It's really simple. The right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. An AR-15 is an arm. It's a bearable arm. It's a keepable arm. It's an arm that's useful for self-defense and an arm that's useful for militia service. It's useful for a lot of lawful purposes. So in order for it to be banned, the government has to prove that it isn't protected. Not the other way around. It's not, it's not the plaintiff's job to prove that it should be. Okay, counsel, may, but before you get further into the merits of your argument, can, can I ask, and I'm going to ask your, your friend on the other side the same question. What is your view of the relationship between this case and the uh, Duncan case pending before an en banc panel uh, of, of this court? Do we think the cases are, are highly related? Uh, they involve very similar evidentiary uh, considerations, the same Bruin standard. Uh, the plaintiffs even viewed the cases as related when they filed their notice of related cases at the commencement of this case in the district court to relate this case to Duncan. So this is correct. The cases are related because the statute in California that bans so-called high capacity magazines is the same statute that bans so-called assault weapons. And one of the key elements of California's assault weapon ban is that it, it has to be a semi-automatic rifle. But for most in most cases, for a firearm to fall under the assault weapon ban, not always, but most cases, it has to have the ability to accept a detachable magazine. Um, if firearms, they, they've changed this over the years, but generally around the country, if a firearm has a fixed magazine, it isn't so easy for that firearm to fall under the purview of an assault weapons ban. Now, the key difference is that obviously magazines are an essential part of, of firearms. That's why it's being argued that it's protected by the Second Amendment, because if you ban magazines, then you force everyone to go back to single shot rifles where you can only have one round in the chamber and nothing in a magazine, which is ridiculous. That would stretch us all the way back to pre-Civil War firearms technology. But at the end of the day, there, there are differences here because while the ban on high capacity magazines, that, that basically deals with a box and a spring, right? Um, it's, it'll be far easier for them to say that that's not a gun than it will be for them to claim that the AR-15 and other targeted so-called assault weapons don't count as arms. So do you think, I mean, do, do you want us, uh, what, what do you want us to do based on uh, that, that observation? I mean, should, should we hold this case pending Duncan or should we you know, go ahead and, I mean, what, what's your view? So we wouldn't object uh, if this panel uh, wished to hold this case pending resolution of the Duncan en banc proceeding, given the similarities between this case and Duncan. Uh, but we, we've also shown, uh, based on the record developed in this case, that California's restrictions on assault weapons are constitutional under the Supreme Court's Bruin standard. No, they didn't. Um, I have another podcast episode where me and, and Mr. Producer, I believe it was Mr. Mr. Producer Josh, went through Judge Benitez's ruling, and he did not hold that they had a sufficient historical record. He said that it was completely lacking, and I'll, I'll pull up at least one part of this later in the, uh, in the show. But um, they're, they're appealing it and pretending that <coughs> the lower court decision never happened, that Judge Benitez didn't pick apart every single historical analog they tried to present. Um, which is very, a very interesting way to go about an appeal. And also under Heller. But the, there are supervening questions in this case. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to pause right here because I have, I have a note that I want, that I want to add. Bruin is, is important because, as I said, it stopped courts from engaging in this interest balancing. Now, the Supreme Court said the interest balancing, balancing the right to keep barons against the state's interest to keep, keep people safe, was unacceptable. Um, so what they've done is they've taken the Heller case, which basically said um, the Second Amendment protects firearms that are in common use. This is going to be something that we hear, <coughs> hear over and over again in this hearing. In common use, in common use, what does it mean? 
and as I'm going to cover throughout this episode, they're trying to ignore that the in common use standard has already been defined by the Supreme Court. Let's keep listening. And in Duncan, which seem to be extremely similar, i.e., what does common use mean? What does dangerous and unusual mean? Um, in what order do you, do you decide these things? Uh, what are relevant um, historical analogs, which even those overlap substantially because the, and, and some of the statute is even the same with regard to um, magazines with more than 10 rounds, right? That's so correct, there, Your Honor. So they're, they're, these are not just abstractly connected, they are evidentially connected. I think that's right, Your Honor. Uh, some of the definitions in an assault weapon relate specifically to magazine capacity for certain rifles and certain pistols. Uh, and even more generally, as Your Honor observed. And, and, and this is something that I, I mentioned earlier, the, the ability for a semi-automatic firearm to accept a detachable magazine is really a, a crucial element of California's assault weapon ban. Though it isn't necessary. You can have an, a so-called assault weapon if you have a fixed magazine with a larger capacity. But those firearms are exceedingly rare, and the majority of guns that they attempted to ban through this legislation dealt with semi-automatic firearms that can accept a magazine. Uh, the state is relying on many of the same historical analogs and the same na nationwide tradition of weapons regulation, in this case and in Duncan. Uh, there are substantial uh, material overlaps Meanwhile, between the cases. We, we have a stay in this case and a stay in Duncan, is that right? Is That's correct, Your Honor. There's a stay pending appeal in Duncan and an administrative stay in this case at this time. Okay. So if I can address the threshold inquiry under Bruin. Uh, at the threshold stage, the plaintiffs have not Actually, met... Counsel, if I yes, could jump in and interrupt you for a moment before you get to that threshold um, merits question. Um, in the state's view, is the record fully developed in this case? I, I appreciate and recognize the fact that uh, the Seventh Circuit case of Bevis was in a different procedural posture because that was a preliminary injunction stage, but at one point in the opinion, uh, the circuit said that there could be uh, some development of the record that would aid in the court's uh, view as to whether an AR-15 is closer to an M-16 or whether it, it's closer on the other line. Um, I, you've had multiple opportunities to brief and present evidence the district court in the state's view. Have you put everything that you've got on the table there? So this is an interesting question because she's pointing to, as she says, when the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeal um, heard challenges to Illinois, so-called assault weapons ban, um, they decided not to prevent that law from going into effect. But in doing so, they also admitted that the evidence that Illinois had presented to the court was, was pretty much half-baked and it, it wasn't really fleshed out. They were making a lot of assumptions that weren't necessarily real. Um, and it's interesting to see this judge, because this judge, uh, Nguyen, I think that's how you pronounce that name, different people pronounce it differently she was on the three judge panel that back in 2021 heard this case back in 2021 heard this case um yeah right there so she had previously held that it was constitutional for california to ban so-called assault weapons supreme court smacked that down and said no that's ridiculous so now she gets a chance to do it again so they spent all this time explaining why assault weapons can be banned. Supreme Court says you were completely wrong. And now she has to go through the process of finding another way to keep them banned because everything she just said a couple years ago was, was thrown out. With respect to the, the threshold inquiry about whether these regulated weapons are self-defense weapons, we do think that we've established a robust evidentiary record showing that these weapons are not weapons of self-defense and that they are like the M16 and similar weapons that the Supreme Court has indicated may be banned because of their offensive nature and characteristics. So he keeps talking about the M16, 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 and we'll, we'll cover this in the episode. The, the judges here couldn't tell a butt stock from a muzzle. They don't know, they don't know firearms. But a really significant logical hole in California's argument is that if a gun can be made fully automatic, 
that means it's just as dangerous. And this is what they've been trying to do for decades. This is what many congressmen and senators wanted to do when the NFA passed in the 30s. They wanted to ban semi-automatic weapons and fully automatic weapons. Congress made the decision not to ban semi-automatics. Um, so because the M16 can be fired fully automatic or in a three-round burst, select fire mode, California is arguing that any similar weapon that is only semi-automatic should be banned as well. So what is to stop a manufacturer from taking a different semi-automatic design. Let's say the Mini-14, which generally uh, isn't considered an assault weapon. There is a fully automatic version of the Mini-14 out there. There's very few of them, but they did figure out how to do that. So is the claim then that even though this gun doesn't qualify as an assault weapon, it's still too dangerous for civilians to own because it could either be made fully automatic or it's substantially similar to a fully automatic version? By banning fully automatic automatics, they're banning the actual action of being able to fire multiple rounds with one pull of the trigger. That's the the delineation, right? Um, any semi-automatic gun can be made fully automatic, and and that's what's prohibited here. So while I appreciate that the Beavis uh, decision in the Seventh Circuit was on a preliminary injunction posture. Uh, the court was also examin examining a similar body of evidence as the one that we have developed in this case. Right, and that's why I asked that question, because the um, Bevis court did say that, for example, better data on firing rates may change the analysis, and the district court should, uh, or the district court doesn't have to, but it's free to kind of look at that again, because of... So, I, I got to cover this, because... I, let me put it on the screen. Here's the bit from this, the Seventh Circuit. I'll, I'll read this out loud for everyone listening to the audio version. If you haven't already, do subscribe to the audio version. We try and keep this as audio friendly as we can. This is from the Seventh Circuit decision. There, quote, there are few other differences between the AR-15 and M16, but none that is relevant. The M16 has an automatic firing rate of 700 rounds per minute, while the AR-15 has a semi-automatic rate of only 300 rounds per minute, unless, as we've just noted, it's modified with, for example, a bump stock or a binary trigger, which can double the rate at which semi-automatic weapons can be fired. Both models use the same ammunition, deliver the same kinetic energy, 1,200 to 1,350 foot-pounds, the same muzzle velocity, 2,800 to 3,100 feet per second, and the same effective range, 602 to 875 yards. And these kind of supply with equal force the high-capacity handguns that are restricted by these laws. The latter are almost indistinguishable from the 17 or 21 round M17 and M18 pistols. That's the, the P320, which is one of the most popular handguns in uh, the United States. It seems like the Seventh Circuit just typed into Wikipedia or Google firing rate because this is, it, it, this is what happens. If you Google search firing rate of an AR-15, it pulls out 601 yards to 875 yards effective firing range, um, which is, is ludicrous, right? If you have a fully automatic rifle, your effective firing range at a point target firing at a single human-sized target half a kilometer away a fully automatic rifle isn't going to hit that you might hit it on the first round but as, as soon as you start firing multiple rounds for that single trigger pull that recoil is going to move the rifle all over the place and you're not going to hit a target half a kilometer away 550 meters away the effective range of the m16 ironically is you, they use its semi-automatic function, right? So just because an M16 or M4 has a fully automatic or select fire mode doesn't mean that it also can't be fired semi-automatically. So when the military is testing how far can it realistically be used to hit a, a man-sized target downrange, the semi-automatic function is what they use for that because it's the most accurate. So it's ridiculous for the, for any court to say that AR-15 should be banned because they have the same effective firing range as uh, an M16 because that's the semi-automatic function, right? If you're, if you're going to argue that AR-15 should be banned, it should be because they can do what the fully automatic versions can do, not because the fully automatic version can be fired semi-automatically. You know, does that make sense? The, the other side of this is um, most of this 
is related to bullets and, and rounds and powder, right? Um, the kinetic energy, energy and the muzzle velocity will be the same through any rifle with a similarly sized barrel, right? You could have the Ruger Mini 14, as I said, that that's you can hit a target out to half a kilometer. Any bolt action rifle chambered in 223 or 556 five, would have the same kinetic energy muzzle velocity. So they're trying to say that it's so dangerous because it uses a certain type of ammunition. But the ammunition isn't what's banned. Ammunition is what's banned. And and it is wild, as I, as I just said, that the Seventh Circuit was insinuating that the Sig Sauer P320, one of the most popular handguns in the country, sh could fall outside the Second Amendment because the military had branded it as the M16 or the, the M8, 17 or M18. Um, someone should really tell these people that every time the U.S. military retires one of its semi-automatic pistols, they, by law, sell those pistols to the civilian marksmanship program, who in turn sells them to American civilians because, by law, that's allowed, and there are lawful purposes to have those weapons. Um, so just really wild all around. Loading that's necessary in order to really make both of these weapons work. So I wondered if there was, in the state's view, a similar potential gap in the evidence that the state uh, could fill, or whether you've, with the multiple opportunities you've had, have put it all out there, and that we're only going to address the merits question here. So I, I want to bring this up because it seems like this judge is having a hard time differentiate between reloading, which, as we all know, is removing a spent magazine and putting a new magazine in, and the firearm action basically stripping a spent case and pushing another cartridge into battery. Semi-automatic firearms have been owned by Americans since the late 1800s. Um, manually cycled firearms even earlier, right? There were Henry rifles used in the Civil War. So this idea that it is crazy for the American people to have a firearm that can easily eject a spent case and push another one into battery um, it's ridiculous. It would require banning any gun that was invented in the last, what, 150 years? So the Beavis Court did identify some potential areas for further factual development, uh, but it's notable in this case that the plaintiffs have not developed uh, any facts to fill those holes. The plaintiffs have not shown that the regulated weapons, including pistols and shotguns, for which they offer barely any evidence at all, uh, they have not uh, shown that the assault weapons being regulated are not like the M16 or similar weapons and are not. So just so we're clear, the state of Cal, and again, it is not the plaintiff's job to prove that bearable arms, firearms, are presumptively protected by the Constitution. It is the government's job under Bruin to prove that they shouldn't be. And what you can hear this attorney for California state is he basically criticizes the plaintiffs for not proving that handguns and shotguns are different from M16s. He, he's so eager to demonize the M16, the, the, the M4. Um, I, he's never going to say M4. That would just blow their mind. Um, but they want desperately to stop the court from recognizing that the vast majority of firearms that fall under California's assault weapons ban are not the M16, right? A semi-automatic shotgun does not fire the same as an M16. Um, my daily carry pistol is an FN 509 compact tactical. Now, I legally own a suppressor. I own a suppressor that um, it's a silent circle hybrid. I, I own one suppressor and I use it for a bunch of different calibers. So when I buy a semi-automatic rifle or shotgun, I want there to be a threaded barrel so I can use my suppressor that I legally own or use muzzle brakes or other legal lawful attachments. Under California law, the pistol that I carry on my person daily for self-defense is banned because one of the ways that they define a pistol as an assault weapon is if it has a threaded barrel. Because even if it's legal to put something on that, the very act of it being threaded is, is too dangerous, for, in their opinion, for people to own. So if you were to take my daily carry pistol and put it up against an M16, it's nothing alike. Nothing alike. But the state here, California here, is trying to get the court to believe that they are presumptively the same unless the plaintiffs can prove otherwise.
not offensive military weapons. So the, the evidentiary record as it exists, the record developed by the parties jointly in this case, uh, is not materially different uh, from the Beavis record. And, and we think that the record does show uh, that at the threshold stage and the historical stage of the Bruin standard, the assault weapon restrictions are constitutional. So the, 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 the threshold stage in Bruin is, uh, the court said, when the Second Amendment's plain text covers an individual's conduct, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the Constitution presumptively covers that conduct, mm -hmm. right? And you're saying that um, that you can win at the threshold stage, which I take it means that in your view, the Second Amendment's plain text does not apply uh, to these kinds of weapons. Is that right? So the threshold, that, that, that's close, Your Honor. So at the threshold stage, the court does look at the plain text of the Second Amendment, whether the restriction burdens the right of the people to keep and bear bearable arms. But part of that threshold analysis does look at history, namely the original public meaning of the terms in the Second Amendment. So the words in the Second Amendment alone are indeterminate. The court needs to look at the historical context of those words and common use for self-defense. Okay, so just, just stop them right there. The Second Amendment, the words of the Second Amendment are determined. I mean, they are preset. And the Supreme Court defined what they meant in Heller, McDonald versus Chicago, and Bruin. The words are set. What, what California is trying to do is drag us back to a pre-Heller world where these lower court judges and appellate judges get to decide what the Second Amendment means. No. The Supreme Court has defined what the Second Amendment means, and they've tasked these lower courts with enforcing that definition. The irony of ironies is that California wants to go back to before Heller and, and use an older definition of the Second Amendment, but they don't want to adopt the pre-Heller Miller holding, which supported the civilian ownership of military uh, useful, militarily useful firearms is a limiting principle at that threshold stage. And, and why, is, why is that? Is, it, is that because it's part of the definition of what an arm is? Or because it's part of, maybe we're, we're in the... And, and, and just, just so we understand what the plain text means, right? The, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. You look at that text and you say, is the AR-15 an arm? The Supreme Court defined arms as firearms and other arms, not just firearms, but other weapons, right? The plain text protects civilian ownership of AR-15s. He's trying to argue that if you look at a sentence, which let's make it really simple. Let's break this down into like kindergarten language. Civilians can own guns. Is the AR-15 a gun? Yes. So it should be presumptively pr protected unless the state can prove otherwise. I mean, I, I, I take the point that the plain text is not just, you know, is plain text informed by historical understanding of the text, but um, what, what textual um, uh, indicia would you point to to, to extract the uh, self-defense component of that? Yeah, so the, the Supreme Court has not identified exactly which term it relates to. I think it relates, as the Beavis Court uh, indicated it, relates to whether an arm is a bearable arm within the scope of the Second Amendment. Uh, and on page 32 of Bruin, uh, the Supreme Court observed that no party disputed that the handgun, the weapon at issue in Bruin, was in common use today for self-defense. So I'm just going to stop here. The Supreme Court did a very good job at explaining what is presumptively protected it feels it's almost like he didn't read the Heller decision or the Bruin decision and he just is going off of what gun control organizations want him to think it's said here's a section right from Heller um some have made the argument bordering on the frivolous that only those arms in existence in the 18th century are protected by the second amendment we do not interpret constitutional rights this way just as the first amendment protects modern forms of communication and the fourth amendment applies to modern forms of search the second amendment extends prima facie to all instruments that constitute bearable arms even those that were not in existence at the time of the founding the supreme court defined a bearable arm as an arm that can be carried Right, the Supreme Court didn't consider a tank 
to be a bearable arm. When they talk about bearable arms, that's to basically limit the scope of their decision to only those weapons that are carryable that would be useful to be carried. Now, there are extreme examples of uh, shoulder-fired tactical nuclear weapons, which obviously the Supreme Court would probably need to find a way to argue that out of being a bearable arm. Um, but right here, the Heller decision clearly states the Second Amendment extends to all instruments that constitute bearable arms, whether or not the technology existed at the time of the founding. Uh, so the Supreme Court made clear that the common use for self-defense inquiry belongs at the threshold stage, and it likely does relate to whether a weapon is a bearable arm based on the original public meaning. So, and, so your, your, your position is that this would be, I mean, these kinds of weapons would be outside the original public meaning of what a bearable arm is. That's correct, Your Honor, because these are military weapons. These are not weapons of ordinary self-defense. So this feels crazy. And this is just, it, the standard is not whether a firearm is useful for self-defense. That's not the standard. Obviously, the Second Amendment protects firearms that are useful for self-defense, and self-defense is one of the reasons for this. Um, but it, it, the standard is that it's commonly possessed by law-abiding citizens for lawful purposes. And that's the language that Samuel Alito put in his concurrence for Caetano versus Massachusetts, which is a case I'll talk about a lot here. It was a case after Heller that challenged Massachusetts's ban on stun guns and tasers. And the Massachusetts Supreme Court had argued and, and held that the Second Amendment didn't apply to firearm technologies like tasers and stun guns because that never was around at the time of the founding and it couldn't possibly have been the second amendment couldn't possibly apply to a technology the founders never could have foreseen so when samuel alito wrote the concurring opinion for k town versus massachusetts he made it very clear that the standard is whether a firearm is commonly possessed by law-abiding citizens for lawful purposes obviously self-defense is the most important lawful purpose but americans also have the right to own firearms for target practice for hunting right for yes god forbid militia service um so this the california attorney general's office is trying to pigeonhole this into just talking about self-defense when in reality the the case law before them doesn't require a gun to be defensive for it to be protected and i mean when we look at heller right so it, it starts with you know they've got you know dr oh and i, I just want to put this on the screen real quick um this is this is the part that this is the part of the Caetano concurrence from Sam Alito that makes it very clear this doesn't just apply to guns that are militarily useful. Um, so here, here, here's the part. The court next asked whether stun guns are dangerous per se at common law and unusual in an attempt to apply one important limitation on the right to keep and carry arms to the historical tradition of prohibiting the carrying of dangerous and unusual weapons. In doing so, the court concluded that stun guns are unusual because they are a thoroughly modern invention. Um, <laughs> but it was in common use. So it's in common use. And, it, and just being a modern invention doesn't mean that it's, um, it's not useful. And you can see at the bottom here, the bottom is the relevant part. Um, do I have the wrong... I think I have the wrong one. Where is it? Which one is this? Hold on. Let me let me see if I can. Didn't I put this one up? Hold on. Let me. Uh, I did not add this one. Let me add this one right here, it's just so I can. I apologize. I thought I had added every single one of these to today. I'm, I'm looking at that, trying to figure out why it's not what I was ready for it to be. Here we go. Here we go. This is from Caetano. Um, I'll read the bottom part. Uh, da, 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 da. In any event, the Supreme Judicial Court's assumption that stun guns are unsuited for militia or military use is untenable. Section 131 allows law enforcement and correctional officers to carry stun guns and tasers, presumably for such purposes as non-lethal crowd control. Subduing members of the mob is a little different from suppressing insurrections, yada, yada, yada. Um, so he's making it very clear that... The Second Amendment protects such weapons as a class, 
regardless of any particular weapon's suitability for military use. Protects it as a class, regardless of whether or not it's useful for military purposes, meaning a weapon's usefulness for military purposes has no bearing on whether it is a protected arm under the Second Amendment. I apologize. Um, that's the only one that I, I don't think I added, so we should be clear from here on out. And some of the other 18th century dictionaries that just define arms as weapons, right, which, which these clearly are. Um, and in Heller, it was common ground that you know, everybody agreed that it at least applied to weapons you would use in militia service. And then the question was, does it also apply to uh, other kinds of weapons? I, as I read Heller, there wasn't really any question that um, weapons that would be used by people in the military would count as arms, uh, was there? So at the founding in, in 1791, when the Second Amendment was ratified. Really good analysis from this judge. Um, throughout the entirety of the United States history, even pre-Heller, the understanding was that you had a right to keep and bear arms because, God forbid, you're called up for militia service. The expectation is that you show up with your own personal firearm that you are trained and equipped to use. And the, expectat the other expectation is that in doing so, you show up with a rifle or a weapon that would be useful in that militia service, right? If, God forbid... There is a uh, draft or, or we're attacked and they call up the militia, right? If you show up to defend the United States with a 410 shotgun designed to shoot pigeons, they're not going to let you go to the front line with a 410 shotgun. Now, one, because that's not going to be very useful, but also because it doesn't fire ammunition that is standardly uh, given to U.S. soldiers. So... Back at the time of the founding, it, if you were to show up for militia service, you wanted to make sure that your rifle or your musket or whatever was chambered in a, in, in a, for a round for a diameter bullet, musket ball, that would be useful, right? I mean, back then you could melt down lead and, and form your own bullets. But like, if, if the military uses a 30-round bullet and you show up with a 40-round... Uh, sorry, if the military uses a 30 caliber um weapon and you show up with a 40 caliber weapon it's not going to be very helpful because eventually you're going to run out of ammo and you're not going to be able to be resupplied ratified uh, the supreme court observed in heller that the same weapons that were commonly kept at home for ordinary purposes like salt like self-defense those were the same types of weapons that militiamen brought to muster but over time so that should be the end of this entire thing what california just admitted was at the time of the founding the, the weapons that were useful for self-defense were the same types of weapons that you would be, that would be useful for military purposes. So all you need to do is, is invert that, that military weapons are useful for self-defense. That was true at the founding. It was true at the ratification of the 14th Amendment, and it's true now. That should be the end of this case, but California won't give up. Because of technological advancement, uh, certain weapons have fallen outside of the scope of the Second Amendment. Uh, even if they might be useful. And so I'm going to call bullshit on that again. Um, I, I, I read this part earlier by accident, but I'll add it back. Um, it extends to all arms that were not in existence at the time of the founding. Just because technology wasn't around in the 1700s or the mid 1800s doesn't mean that the Second Amendment doesn't protect it, right? Um, and, and as I, I go through in, in my book, again, The Conservative's Guide to Winning Every Gun Control Argument, there were technologies that were known to the founders at the ratification of the Constitution where they could foresee, coming down the pike, multi-shot firearms. Firearms that could shoot multiple shots before having to be reloaded. Lewis and Clark traveled the country with a Ghirondoni air rifle which had like 20 rounds in its magazine. It's not, a, it's not a Red Rider BB gun. These were air rifles that could take down game animals using compressed air. Throughout the U.S. history, there was an understanding then and now where firearm technology was going. And the only exception would, would, that would really wouldn't exist would maybe be railgun technology. But um, even that, you, you have to come up with a really good explanation for why a railgun wouldn't be a bearable arm 
Like j just because federal law defines a firearm as a, as a weapon that expels a projectile using gunpowder doesn't mean that a rail gun, one that uses electromagnetism to shoot um, a magnetic bullet down a barrel, wouldn't be protected as well. Service, as the Seventh Circuit stated in, in Beavis, in Heller, the Supreme Court severed the relationship between the prefatory clause, which is focused on militia service, and the operative clause, which is focused on weapons for ordinary self-defense. So he's not wrong. He's not wrong here in that your right to keep and bear arms is a right to own a firearm unconnected with militia service. And what that means is that you don't have to be in a militia to have a right to keep and bear arms. But there is still an expectation that an armed civilian populace would form the militia. Now, there's federal statutes that dictate who would, would be a member of the organized militia, which is the National Guard, or the unorganized militia, which is, I, I believe it's like adults, male adults, 18 to 35, or female members of the National Guard or retired members of the National Guard. Um, but there's the expectation that there is still a militia aspect, because the militia isn't showing up and being part of a military unit. The militia is, it's all of us. We all are part of the militia that just hasn't been called up yet, right? So if you showed up in 2024 with a Revolutionary War or Civil War firearm, you'd be laughed at. And as I said earlier, they wouldn't let you use that at the front. Now, primarily because the armorer wouldn't be able to maintain that weapon. They wouldn't be able to supply replacement parts. And the military wouldn't be able to provide powder and ammunition for you to fire it once you ran out. To argue that modern firearms are somehow beyond the reach of the American people and is to say that there should be an expiration date on the very concept of a militia, the very concept of the Second Amendment, right? Because what California is arguing is that these firearm technologies, semi-automatic firearm technologies that were invented after 1950, but in reality, after like 1880. These technologies are just too dangerous, too dangerous for civilians to be trusted, right? What they're saying is that eventually there will come a time where firearm technology has advanced so much that the militia is just not a thing anymore, right? Because if they're saying you can only own firearm technologies from 1900, eventually th those technologies will be obsolete. I mean, today you can use a 1911 handgun made in 1911 and, and kill people just fine, right? But they're, they're actually arguing that there is a, an almost expiration date on the Second Amendment. And, and this, is, um, <coughs> this, is, this is from, uh, I believe this is from Heller. Um, let's add this to the screen. Yes, this is Heller basically departing from that military equipment language. Of course, they quote, we think that Miller's ordinary military equipment language must be read in tandem with what comes after. Ordinary, when called for militia service, able-bodied men were expected to appear bearing arms supplied by themselves and in the kind in common use at the time. The traditional militia was formed of a, from a pool of men bringing arms in common use at the time for law for purposes like self-defense. When you read it in this context, in common use isn't just what kind of guns the civilians were using. The context suggests that in common use also applies to the type of guns that the military was using. Because as I just said, if you show up with a gun that they can't give you ammunition for, it, it's a pointless endeavor. And here, the, the weapons that are being regulated are not self-defense weapons. Just going to say again, the standard is lawful purposes and common use for lawful purposes not in common use just for self-defense. And they are, I think it's important also to observe, Your Honor, that the definitions that are being challenged in this case do target specific accessories. These are combat-oriented accessories that exacerbate the lethality of the underlying weapons. Like, So this, this is horseshit. And, and I'm glad that they're going down this path because on the one hand, they just said that it's the semi-automatic action. Actually, no, they said it's the bullet. It's the two, two, three, five, five, six bullet. That's too dangerous. And that's why you much ban them. But then they come around and they say the opposite, which is, oh no, actually it's, it's the accessories. So I know we just told you that the semi-automatic action can fire just as fast as a machine gun. And that's why it should be banned. But actually it's the ability to use a, an adjustable stock or 
a pistol grip or a flash hider, these evil features, right? Now, what he's leaving out is that the evil features test within California's assault weapons ban is not the primary method of banning so-called assault weapons. The primary method that California banned so-called assault weapons is by name. Now, in California, it is illegal to own an AR-15. What does that mean? It's illegal to own any semi-automatic firearm with the word AR-15 etched or engraved into it. That is true. You could have a gun that doesn't violate the features test in California law. But if you write AR-15 on the side of it or stamp it or etch it or engrave it, it becomes automatically banned because California has said no one can own a gun that's called the AR-15 that's named the AR-15. Now, the easiest way to get around that is say, okay, we're just not going to name it the AR-15 anymore. Give it a different number letter designation. So that's why they have the copycat provisions within the law, which is say, okay, other than the name firearms, you can't have a gun that has a pistol grip, the ability to accept a detachable magazine or any of these other features, right? Um, so it's, it's just very interesting that they're going back and forth, that the action is what's evil. No, actually, it's the bullets. Actually, it's the accessories. They just don't like these guns an AR platform rifle, for example, which enable a shooter to fire sustained, rapid, semi-automatic fire, and other features that enable a shooter to conceal their location. Yes. Fabulous. Thank you for spewing the bullshit. He's talking about a flash hider, flash suppressor, and that's a really scary term. But a flash suppressor is not designed to hide a shooter's location. A flash suppressor is to allow someone to shoot a firearm with night vision goggles on and not blind themselves with their own muzzle flash. So when you shoot a gun, not all of the powder, depending on how long the barrel is, not all of the powder will burn before the projectile leaves the muzzle. So you'll have a muzzle flash, a little burst of a fire burst of light. Now the two, two, three round, five, six round in a 16 inch barrel will do that. So, what's been developed is what's called a flash suppressor. So that if you're wearing night vision goggles and shooting at night, it basically redirects the gases out to make it less likely for those gases and, and the unspent powder to ignite and cause a big flash. So you don't blind yourself. If you're shooting at night with a flash suppressor, other people can still see the gunshots. A flash suppressor does not hide the shooter. It simply makes it easier to shoot with night vision. And California has not indicated at any point that being able to shoot with night vision is a problem in any way, shape, or form. And the it, plaintiffs have... It, is it the state's view? I mean, in the state's view, could you prohibit all semi-automatic firearms? I mean, I... Watch how he doesn't answer that question. I realize that that would be considerably broader than the statute would be, you have, but but would that be permissible? It would be substantially broader than the law we're developing, developing or defending in this case and the record that we've developed in this case. It would depend on the record assembled, uh, but the statute were No, it wouldn't depend on the record established, right? When Heller was decided, when Dick Heller sued to get the right to carry a pistol in public, uh, sorry, to get a right to own a pistol. The first gun that he tried to register was a semi-automatic handgun, right? That was the first gun he tried to register. In New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin, when the lawsuit was filed to allow people to carry firearms in public, the lead plaintiffs wanted to carry a semi-automatic pistol. When Otis McDonald sued the city of Chicago to be allowed to own a firearm, he wanted to own a semi-automatic pistol. He wanted to own a 1911 because that's what he was comfortable with from his military service. So when they say, oh, we have to look at the record, the record's settled. You cannot just ban semi-automatic firearms. Every modern case that the Supreme Court has used to expand the Second Amendment and make sure it's understood as protecting an individual right, the firearm in question that people wanted to own or carry was a semi-automatic firearm. But he's trying to sweep that all under the rug. Sweep that all under the rug. That alone should disqualify any attempt, any attempt,
to claim that semi-automatic fire is just too dangerous for civilians to own. We're well, I mean, it was, what, what, what in the record would it depend on? It would depend on the types of firearms that would be subsumed uh, within that particular type of regulation. Uh, I, I'm not standing here today, I cannot say that the state of California would be able to ban all semi-automatic weapons what, or all semi- You could say it. You could just admit that would be unconstitutional, but don't want to make that argument in court in case the day comes when they try it. Definition of a semi-automatic weapon. So a semi-automatic weapon is a weapon uh, that can fire one round for each pull of the trigger. And a sem but that's, uh, as I understand it from the, the um, Duncan case, a ordinary um, um, pistol with a, a magazine does that for as, for as much as the magazine lasts. It does, Your Honor, but it, but California is not regulating these weapons. So okay, so this is very interesting. So her name is Marsha Burzon, that judge right there. And that, it, it almost feels like a gotcha question. It's either a gotcha question or she doesn't know what it, a semi-automatic firearm is. She's asking, so wait, you want to ban semi-automatics? That's how every firearm functions. It's not entirely true. There are other guns. But in her, basically, she's admitting that the state is claiming that a gun is dangerous and unusual. And that the argument the state's making would apply to, in her mind, every gun. Now, what's interesting is that that's the question. Does she not know what a semi-automatic firearm is? Or has she forgotten? Because just two years ago, three years ago, she was involved in a case looking at this very question. Right? And, and this is what she wrote. Now, I, I say she wrote facetiously. It sounds like her, her clerks wrote it if she doesn't know what a semi-automatic firearm is. But this is right from her 44-page um, <coughs> concurring decision. Um, and she says that she's read the amicus briefs um, that explain what a semi-automatic weapon is. Semi-automatic weapons capable of firing a large number of rounds without reloading. That's, that's, what, that's how she's demonized it. Just a little interesting. Because of their semi-automatic action. Uh, it's the fact that but, but that's what makes it semi-automatic. That's what I'm trying to. As, as long as you can shoot more than one round, um, or some larger number of rounds, um, by pulling the trigger each time. Again, being semi-automatic isn't the sole, and he's right. It's not the sole reason that a gun would be classified as what they call assault weapons, but it's the first test. Right. In order to be classified as an assault weapon, it needs to be semi-automatic. So right off the bat. The assault weapon test in California presumes that having a semi-automatic gun itself makes it just too dangerous. And the minute you, you attach a pistol grip or a buttstock, oh man, straight to jail. So with a semi-automatic firearm, if I'm understanding the question, Your Honor, and let me know if I'm not, uh, but with each pull of the trigger, a single round is fired. And a select fire or fully automatic weapon... you don't weapon, have to reload the gun. That's the point. Uh, you would still have to reload the firearm. Eventually, if, but not for each one. That's correct. So this is scary. She's confusing reloading the gun with rechambering around, which is crazy because, again, she wrote that 44 page concurrence, apparently, at that point at least, uh, knowing what this was all about. Correct. It depends on the number of but rounds in the magazine. There, there's a lot of material in the record about other characteristics of the um, A15. That's what we're talking about, right? Uh, Nope, not the A-15, AR-15. Again, she, she doesn't know this issue. The AR-15 and, and generic AR platform rifles. Um, which seem to say that, that they, they shoot faster and um, more aggressively and, um, uh, and the kinds of um, munitions that they shoot are more dangerous and so on. I mean, it's the state at no point has banned 223556 ammo they've tried to say that this ammo is exclusive to what they call assault weapons but it isn't true it isn't true at all um which is again a scary way for the court to take it because that's an issue that is not before the court but they seem very willing to assume that that's what this is all about is that part of the definition or part of the reason for regulating them yes it is the the capabilities that california is regulating the particular types of accessories and features 
don't only enable semi-automatic fire, it's sustained rapid semi-automatic fire. Okay, more bullshit. Um, it's actually stunning that the attorney here can lie like this. The accessories that they've banned are not banned because they make the guns fire faster. They're banned because they looked at the type of guns they want to be banned, and they looked at the most common denominators. What all these guns have in common? Oh, let's ban what they all have in common, right? Jerry Michalak, speed shooter, very famous speed shooter. Um, he set a world record in the 1990s for firing eight rounds from a revolver at one target in one second, and then eight rounds at four targets in 1.06 seconds. He used a different revolver, a six-shot revolver, and he was able to do six shots, a reload, and then another six shots in 2.99 seconds. So I, I just want to talk about that because that is speed shooting, a revolver, a non-semi-automatic revolver. Now, he, he's a very fast shot. But when he then wanted to set the, the world record for a semi-automatic 1911 handgun, he ended up shooting 27 shots in 3.7 seconds. Now, I'll do the math for you. That's one shot per 0.14 seconds. And that comes out to a pace of eight shots in 1.09 seconds. So three one hundredths of a second. Oh, no, sorry, nine one hundredths of a second slower than the revolver. Just so we're clear, a tenth of a second is the amount of time it takes for you to blink your eyes. So Michael Wilcox went on YouTube and he posted a world record time for a lever action rifle. I believe it was a Rossi rifle. Um, he shot 44-40 ammunition, 10 rounds on target in 1.55 seconds. That's incredibly fast. Not a semi-automatic rifle, a lever action rifle. That's a pace of one round per 0.155 seconds, which means he would have fired eight rounds in 1.24 seconds only marginally slower than the semi-auto and revolver speeds. And just as I said, a tenth of a second is generally how long the average person takes to blink their eyes. We're talking about a difference of one and a half blinks per eight rounds. If the state can ban an entire class of firearms because they can be fired quickly with a subjective ability to determine what is too quick for civilians to be able to shoot, then they'd be able to ban every type of firearm action developed after the early 1800s. Lever action, gone. Pump action, gone. Semi-automatic, gone. Don't show them what a mad minute looks like with a Lee Enfield rifle. They'll say that's too fast. Gone. So th this is a really slippery slope. And the fact that they're convincing the judges that this is like an acceptable way to look at this, really scary. And if the court looks at the AR platform rifle, for example, the type of ammunition it fires, 223 Remington or 556 NATO rounds, uh, which are designed to tumble and cavitate on impact with a human being. False. I, I, I feel like a broken record. The 223 round comes from the 222 Remington round. That was the precursor. The 222 Remington was designed as a varmint cartridge. What does that mean? This is the kind of round that was marketed to, hunt, to hunters, ranchers, landowners, because it was particularly useful to dispatch prairie dogs, jackrabbits, coyotes, woodchucks. These are very tiny bullets. In fact, when the 222-223 round was presented to the U.S. military, the U.S. military kind of laughed. The U.S. military's understanding at the time was that a bullet had to be at least 30 caliber to be deadly for a human, they said, oh, wait, you want a 22 rifle? We're going to go to war with a 22 rifle? So no, the bullet, because like, here's the image of these rounds, just to show you, the left is the 222 Remington. And what they say is, okay, well, we like the bullet, same size bullet, different weights, but same size bullet, diameter bullet. We like that, but we need a little bit more powder behind it to make sure that we can shoot at long distances. So that's the difference. It's the same bullet. Obviously, they go a little bit heavier, but it's the... It's the 224 caliber bullet with a little bit more power powder behind it. That is the 223. But the bullet itself was not designed to cavitate in human beings. It's designed to kill like rabbits and prairie dogs and marmots. Little, little animals. 
I swear, you, you give this guy enough time and he'll he'll convince the court that 22 long rifle is too dangerous for civilians to own because that's how the military trains its cadets sometimes. Uh, the let, me, let me ask you this, counsel. Let's assume that you're right, that in um, the step one of the Bruin analysis, we do look at uh, the common use for self-defense purposes to inform ourselves of whether this is within the scope of arms that's covered. What, what in this record do we look at? Surely it can't be just the number of assault weapons um, owned by Americans at the time, right? Because then that gives rise to that circularity yes. problem. If California hadn't um, rushed to ban assault weapons, there instead of 24.4 million, there might be 50 million out there. So <clears throat> how do we analyze um, a record in this case, not just this particular record, but in general to figure out where uh, within that line drawing problem, we put assault weapons. So California doesn't want the court to even consider how many of these weapons are in civilian hands. They don't even want that to be an issue at all, right? So they're going to say it's dispositive. It's not important. But what the Supreme Court ruled when it, when it overturned Massachusetts's stun gun ban in Catano versus Massachusetts versus Commonwealth, the, the basics of that case, the, the evidence presented in that case, was that stun guns are in common use. This is what the actual plaintiffs who were suing, uh, sorry, I believe this was actually a defense case. Um, the argument against the ban, what it was arguing was that, yeah, sure, Massachusetts banned these stun guns, but they estimated that there were 200,000 stun guns and tasers in civilian hands across the United States. So the Supreme Court held that stun guns and tasers were in common use, even though they were illegal in Massachusetts, by pointing to an evidentiary record that showed 200,000 Americans owned them. So if common use can be applied to something that's owned by 200,000 Americans, even that low estimate of 24 million, which again is a low estimate, they're talking about AR-15s, they're not bringing up the fact that a self-defense handgun with a threaded barrel is an assault weapon too. Um, that's very obviously in common use, very obviously. And, and the circularity is true, right? The circularity is true where like, <laughs> that was something that they tried to argue, the left tried to argue in Heller that handguns weren't in common use because they were banned. Well, yeah, they were banned. The whole point is that you can't ban them. And the idea that you can ban a firearm and then run out the clock and then presume that it's, uh, constitutional to do so is precisely the kind of logic that Heller, McDonald, and Bruin tossed out. Um, but listen to how uh, <laughs> listen to how California tries to run away from the most obvious way to measure in common use. So on page 622 of the Heller opinion, the court focused on the character of the weapon or the type of weapon being regulated. And later in the opinion, the court discussed the characteristics of the handgun that made the handgun the quintessential self-defense weapon. But the court also contrasted that with M16 rifles and the like, which the court found to be, uh, the court determined it would be a startling interpretation of the Second Amendment if the operative clause were extended to protect those types of weapons. So the evidence here shows that AR platform rifles, AK platform rifles, and other regulated assault weapon configurations had the same military pedigree, the same combat functionality to, ena to enable people. So does it matter that there's... So th there, there it is, right? Because like, basically what, the, what they're saying is that a Glock 17 should be banned, could be banned, because it's one part away and a, a, a drilled hole away from being a Glock 18, which is fully automatic, right? Then AR-15 can be banned because all you have to do is cut a metal coat hanger and fold it up the right way and put it inside the trigger. And all of a sudden you've illegally made a machine gun. Um, they're admitting that semi-automatic rifles themselves are too dangerous and should be banned, which is a ridiculously slippery slope because you could argue that any firearm is uh, similar to a machine gun. The point is that it's not a machine gun. There's 24 plus million assault weapons out there. Does uh, that factor into the analysis? In, in it any can way? be considered. I, I think the, the number of weapons can be considered, but I think it's important to note that the Supreme Court never referenced numbers. In Heller, in Heller or McDonald, the Supreme Court did not 
count up the number of handguns, and based on the number of handguns <clears throat> that are manufactured, let alone, many, let alone handguns that are owned by individuals, uh, that did not drive the analysis. It was well, the because... So this is, this is borderline lying to the court. So while the Supreme Court didn't count the number of handguns, they the Supreme Court absolutely recognized in Heller that millions of people own these handguns. Here's the relevant part. Whatever the reason, handguns are the most popular weapon chosen by Americans for self-defense in the home and complete prohibit pro prohibition of their use is invalid. So you don't have to count the specific number in order to recognize that a lot of Americans own them, right? So this isn't a situation where it's like 100 million means it's allowed, but 99 million it isn't. There isn't a hard cutoff. In common use, it's, it's just, it's, it's, kind of this thing that goes without saying, right? And again, if they apply in common use to something that's only owned by 200,000 people, any class of firearms would easily exceed that. So the evidence that there were millions and millions. Of uh, but in talking about machine guns, and they, I mean, they, they really didn't analyze anything. They just said, okay, you can ban machine guns. Um, but you then do get into the circularity. I mean, the, the assault weapons were federally banned for a while. Yes. I don't know. I, were these the same definitions, essentially? or Very the similar. The, the federal definition required two qualifying features. And I gather that since that ban was lifted, the number of machine guns has gone up exponentially. Doesn't know what you're talking about. A little slip of the, slip of the tongue. Is that right? Uh, for for semi-automatic yes. uh, weapons? Right. Uh, the, the plaintiffs estimate, based on industry estimates, that it's about 24 million or so. No, but I mean, uh, since the federal ban was lifted. Yes, more. The numbers were more or many, many, many more? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes but the, num the numbers are not despised. Many, many, many more. The answer is many, 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 many more. Positive uh, here. Otherwise, it well, does lead to I the circularity. I know that, but it's sort of illustrative of this problem that Judge Nguyen alluded to, which is, do you look at the, 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 your opponents are arguing that the numbers are just positive, pretty much, as I understand yes. it. We'll see what they say, but that's my understanding. Yes. Um, and they are arguing that the common use rubric under Heller and Brune means in common use, so if now, not previously. And so one looks at the current situation and simply says, well, there are just so many of them that they're in common use, and that's the end of the story. Um, but that has varied, actually, over time, depending on whether it was regulated or not, uh, illustrating the circularity. So what, what would you look at? So yes and no, right? Um, yes and no. If, if we look at, here's a study that was published in the DOJ's National Institute of Justice. In 1994, the same year that the federal assault weapon ban was enacted. And what you can see here is this study estimated that there were 28 million semi automatic rifles in civilian hands at the time, that there were 49 million uh, shotguns, not necessarily semi automatics, 26 million semi automatic handguns, but 28 million semi automatic rifles. Now, not all of them would, would qualify as a so called assault weapon, but for the state to basically say that this action is what's so dangerous. At the time that the assault weapon ban was passed, it was very common for Americans to own semi-automatic firearms. And the key element here is that because the federal ban was not as strict as California's ban, there were ways for manufacturers to make compliant semi-automatic AR-15s that didn't have that name written on the side and didn't have the evil features. It became very evil. I, I used to live in New Jersey. I own... I still have it near me? No, it's in, in the safe. I own a rifle that is 1994 AWB compliant because I used to live in New Jersey. Um, the difference is California has made it so strict that it's next to impossible, not next to impossible, but next to impossible to create a compliant uh, semi-automatic rifle without inventing other tools, right? I mean, in order to have an AR-15 in California, you have to have all these different buttstock, pistol grip attachments, and you can't use a detachable magazine. You actually have to break open the top and load it by stripper clips through the top. Um, it, it's crazy, but it required additional inventions, additional advancement. Um, 
so w when when she's talking about like oh well they weren't really there weren't that many at the time um no they were yes you look at common use now right but you can also look at common use historically as well too i mean how do you decide um you're trying you're adding a um qualifier which is it's not in common use it's in common use for self-defense and that that the fact that many people have them at home is not the answer to the question so what is the answer to the question i mean how do you look at what is um in what, what evidentiary criteria do we use to decide what's the, in, in common use for self-defense otherwise i mean these people apparently have them what are they doing with them so that's for the plaintiffs to present evidence on. The plaintiffs have not shown that these types of weapon configurations are uh, the type of weapon that would be for well, ordinary self-defense. So again, he's wrong. The plain text, let's, let's put it in kindergarten language because he, they have a hard time reading old-timey constitutional prose. People can have guns. Okay. Is the AR-15 a gun? Yes, it is presumptively constitutional and lawful for people to own guns unless the state can prove otherwise. A million people to sign a declaration saying I have it because I think it's good for self-defense. Would that be the answer to the question? No, the court would still need to look at the character of the weapon. So even if 24 million Americans say that they bought and use an AR-15 for self-defense, this guy still thinks that California and supplant all that reasoning and say, no, you're wrong. And we're allowed to ban it. doesn't matter that you're using it for self-defense. doesn't matter that you've actively chosen this firearm for self-defense. Uh, we don't think it's worthy for self-defense, so therefore we're going to ban it. It's really, really dangerous stuff. But even assuming that these weapons are presumptively protected, at the historical stage, we have uh, developed a robust record of historical analogs and a tradition of firearm regulation that imposed a comparable burden on the right to armed defense that were comparably justified. So this is the, this is the last bit, and we're, I'm going to end this episode there because at, after this, he just kind of repeats himself and leaves. Um, but again, it's very interesting how he is trying to cover up the fact that this supposedly robust historical record was summarily dismissed by Judge Benitez at the lower level in, in district court. Here is uh, one section from that lower court ruling, and I recommend that you go watch my earlier episode on this case if you want to do a deeper dive into that ruling. Judge Benitez writes, quote, This court has previously determined that the state's ban on modern semi-automatics has no historical pedigree. Prior to the 1990s, there was no national history of banning weapons because they were equipped with furniture like pistol grips, collapsible stocks, flash hiders, flare launchers, or threaded barrels. In fact, prior to California's 1989 ban, so-called assault weapons were lawfully manufactured, acquired, and possessed throughout the United States. Before the Bruin decision, the state had unpersuasively argued that its laws are now analogous to a handful of state machine gun firing capacity regulations from 1920s, 1930s, and one District of Columbia law from 1932, a law that the Supreme Court ignored while dismantling the District of Columbia's handgun ban in Heller. While that argument remains unpersuasive today, Bruin invites us to look back farther into the nation's history. So no, this guy's claiming that they've already proved it. Judge Benitez went piece by piece, line by line, and, and discredited all of it. Discredited all of it. There is no historical pedigree to justify banning entire classes of firearms because of different attaches or attachments or what kind of action it is, especially not dating back to the founding and the ratification of the 14th Amendment. Okay, well, that's going to be it for this episode. <laughs> it's crazy. Like, I get it. They have to have time limits, right? They have to have time limits on oral arguments. They can't just let them go forever. But it really is crazy. If you actually look at this, and, and you can go watch this on YouTube, watch the, um, the plaintiff's side. This is such an important issue, right? whether Americans are allowed to defend themselves with a firearm technology that dates back to the late 1800s, right? To allow this to be decided on 20 minutes of oral testimony, of which the vast majority was guided by the judge's questions, questions that, let's be quite honest, were not themselves guided by firearm knowledge. A lot of these were really ignorant questions. 
Um, I get it that they can't just go forever and that uh, most of the argument has to be made in briefs and, and written argumentation, but it is re still crazy that like, it's like, okay, your 20 minutes is up. We'll go figure out what this actually means. Um, really ridiculous. Well, that's going to be it for this episode. Um, if you like the podcast, make sure you subscribe again, subscribe, um, check out my book, the conservative's guide to winning every gun control argument. My next book, the conservative's guide to winning every immigration argument is pretty much finished. Um, I'm, I'm deciding whether I want to add more based on what's going on with Texas and this 2024 proposed, um, immigration bill, but that's pretty much done. It'll be out this week. If I have my way, it'll be out this week. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Links will be in the description for that on Telegram. I'll be posting on Twitter. I just changed my Twitter handle. It used to be at Sandy Politics. That was like an old brand I wanted to make like in, in college. Um, back then, it was more common for people to have like brand-based Twitter. So I changed it to Max McGuire Texas, Max McGuire TX. So follow me there. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it for this edition of the podcast. My name is Max McGuire. Remember, everyone, that the fight to take back the country is not over yet, but the only way we win is if we all stamp and fight together. See you next time.